Lord Jesus, as we have sat at your table this morning and in the spirit, Lord, have gazed once again upon your beauty. Lord, contemplating the great work of redemption. Lord, which has found a lodgment in our own soul. Lord, that we are one in the spirit this morning because we've been bought with the blood. Lord, you were broken, Lord. Lord, like the bread, the corn is broken to produce the bread of life. And Lord, you have given us life and we are glad this morning. Lord, we are a glad people this morning. For Lord, you have reached down and you have redeemed us. And we ask as we consider your word this morning that, Lord, you will speak to us. And Lord, help us, Lord. Lord, to be obedient, Lord, to the heavenly call, the heavenly vision, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We're going to spend some time in Scripture this morning. We're in the book of Esther. We have reached the book of Esther. We've been going chronologically through the Old Testament and looking for Jesus. Praise God, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we're in the book of Esther, and again we're looking for Jesus in the book of Esther. And of course he's there too, isn't he? Hallelujah. Let's start with an opening key verse, as it were, to hang our thoughts on. Chapter 4, verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? But you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Such a time as this. I'm going to talk about this story about Esther. Hallelujah. Praise God. She's, uh, we, you probably know the story well. It's a story celebrated uh, by the Jews every year in the synagogues. The the whole of the book of Esther is read out. And for the children, it's quite an event. I don't know if you know that, but the children come. And they bring griggers, which are rattles that they use at football matches. And they dress up. Now, originally, I think they used to dress up as Esther the Queen. But nowadays, it's a bit like Halloween. They dress up in fancy dress. And when... The, um, on the Bema where they're reading the scriptures every time the name of the the villain Haman is mentioned the children go crazy and they rattle their riggers and they boo and they haul and sometimes the reader has to wait two to three minutes before they'll settle down and they try to read again and they'll read a wee bit and they'll come to the name Haman again and then they erupt and they rattle and they uh, against this villain so it's, a, it's, a, it's an event in the synagogues every year, the Feast of Purim, which of course is to do with the casting of lots. But it's a phenomenal story. It's the story of God's redemption. So right away we have a link with Jesus Christ. There's a very, very general link because, you know, the Nazis were not the first to try and exterminate the Jews. Anti-Semitism is nothing new. We've had it in this country don't know if you were down in York was the time when they slaughtered a lot of Jews in this country. And, uh, of course, uh, this time what is happening is it's, uh, the, the children of Israel have been carried away into captivity because they forsook the covenant of the Lord and they're living in a strange land. And, of course, now the, the king of Persia is in charge and this king, Exodus, if you read the King James Version, you get the Hebrew name, I think it's Asherus. He is in charge. He's in charge of the 127 provinces from um, India to the land of Kush, which is the Nile Valley. A vast, vast territory. This king was really an emperor. And, of course, he celebrated his empire. If you read the story, I'll maybe just recap for maybe any younger folk that are here. Well, the story is that um, the king had a bit like an exhibition you know we had the, a big exhibition in Britain a way back in Bella Houston Park had a big exhibition well his exhibition went on for six months and he showed all 
his treasures. That's what people like to do when they get great. They like to show off. And this man was no different. He liked his pals around him. Just because you're at the top of the tree doesn't mean that you don't like to show off. And he had his wee group of friends and his nobles and his lords. And he set up this big thing. It went for six months it went. 180 days. At the end of 180 days he had a big banquet and a feast. And he brought all his pals in and all his friends and they were, the wine was flowing freely. At the end of seven days he was feeling jolly and he's boastful because he just showed off his greatness. That's what people like to do, isn't it? They like to tell you what they've achieved, you know. He says, what, what is a bore? A bore is somebody who opens his mouth and throws his feet into it. You know, you ever get these people, you're only meeting for two minutes and I've got to tell you what they did, what they did, what they did. Well, this man was no different. And of course, this man, because of his position and the time he lived in, he had women. He had a phenomenal harem of women. Now, I'm not uh, preaching feminism, but when you read this story, you can sympathise with feminists because women were looked on as objects. He had hundreds of them, concubines. He had uh, all these eunuchs that kept a harem. And uh, he, women were brought to him for usage. And because he was a great emperor, they were beautified. They were kept apart from other men by the eunuchs and brought to him for his usage. And, of course, he had one who was his, uh, tra- his, his, away, his um, trophy queen. She had to be absolutely beautiful. And her name was Vashti. And Vashti was his trophy queen. And he decided that he would show her off because uh, he was a big shot. He was a big cheese. So he, he sends for her to, 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 to let everybody see how beautiful it is and how he's got the, the nicest looking woman in the country. And she says, no, I'm not going. I'm not going. Now, I don't know what actually eventually happened to Vashti for doing that. But there was a bit of a kind of upheaval because he said, look, if she gets away with that, all the women in the country will think that they can do what they like. We can't hear that. <laughs> So he takes advice, and the advice is that she should no longer come into his presence. Now, what that meant, in real terms, I don't know. Whether they took her away like Henry VIII did and cut her head off, I'm not sure. But then the word was that they should search the whole land and bring in virgins, young women. And that uh, they should be beautified. Give them a year to go through the beauty treatments. And then brought to the king. And uh, well, the one that he discovered that he liked better than others would be his queen. Of course, we know the story that uh, in the city of Del Susa, where the, this was happening, there was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive this Jehoiakim king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah. That was her name. So there just for a wee second to get some of the chronology and I hope you'll indulge me when I speak about this for a wee while. I won't spend a lot of time on it but I will speak about the chronology. chronology. Now Hadassah was his cousin, Mordecai. Now the name Mordecai, some people have linked it to um, a Murdoch, the, the the Babylonian god, which could possibly be, be because a lot of these people were given new names. You know that, don't you? Daniel was called Belteshazzar, wasn't he? And then you get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were all given new names. Uh, they were carried off into a, a, a strange culture. And they had to live in a strange culture, just like we are today. We're living in a foreign culture. When I was a boy in the 50s, uh, the culture that I lived in is totally different from the culture I'm in today. Uh, we maybe not been physically moved, but everyone else around me has moved, and we need to shine as lights in a dark place. Well, anyway, this man, uh, Mordecai, he is the son of Shimei, and I'm going to mention Shimei in a minute, and also the son of Kish. You know who Kish was, don't you? He was the father of King Saul. You know that? Kish. And uh, why am I going to mention Shimei? I'll mention it in a wee minute. But anyway, we're going with the story first of all. Hadassah got another name as well. She was called Esther, which of course means star. 
A, sorry, a star, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. So she was a rising star, praise God. And of course the star is very symbolic for the coming of the Deliverer. It heralded in the coming of Jesus Christ. And Esther was actually going to be a Deliverer, but she didn't know it. She was a wee girl who was an orphan. Her mum and dad had died while she was away in a strange land. And Mordecai, her trusty old cousin, adopted her and became like a father to her. Looked after her. And then when this king, this political situation came about, Esther was a very fine looking young woman. If you actually read the scripture, it says she had a good figure when you read the NIV version. She looked good. And uh, so she got taken away. The poor soul got taken out of her house because this king got what he liked, you see. Uh, and there have been hundreds of young virgins would have been taken away. Hundreds. How do I know that? Well, if you study your scripture carefully and you read the book of Esther, there's only ten chapters, you'll enjoy it. It's a great wee story. I like stories. And what you'll find is that when did he actually have his big exhibition in his party? It was the third year of his reign. Okay? And then they decided, right, Vasti, you have gone... You've crossed the line here. And the decision was made immediately. And then the advice came, get, get a whole lot of virgins in till you find the one that pleases you. And then she can be the trophy queen. Now what happened was that um, if you read when it was Esther's turn to get sent to the queen. Now let's make no bones about this. They were taken in in the evening. And then they get sent to another part of the harem in the morning. So it was basically the queen, the king was trying them out. That's what. It was. Let's be honest about it. It's not just a man's story. The man had women, different women, brought to him every night. It was the seventh year of his reign that Esther was brought to him. So that means she must have been in the harem for four years. Now, can I say something at this point? Many people, their ministry doesn't come to fruition immediately. Like Joseph, who was in the jail for two years and all the rest of it, they were in the gap. Many of us are in the gap. But then there comes a time when the rising star will come and it is your turn. For such a time as this, you've been brought to the kingdom. You see? And look to God and be patient. Everybody wants it to happen immediately. But the Bible doesn't work like that. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. And this rising star came up. And what happened was, when it was Esther's turn, Mordecai, he would go up and hang about outside the harem and send messages in. He kept tabs on her. Keep tabs on your children. Never break off for your children. He was a, a guardian. She was getting well fed and looked after, but for a purpose. And when she went in, at night to the king and she came out in the, in the morning and the king says oh I liked that one I liked her she got made the queen but Mordecai had said to her listen don't tell him you're a Jew don't tell him you're a Jew now what happened was of course was the, you know the story that this man Haman who was well in with the king he didn't like Jews and Mordecai we don't know that all between it but Mordecai he gave this man no reverence. Everybody had to bow down to this guy Haman, but he didn't do it. He knew where this man, where he was coming from. Don't bow down to the wickedness in this nation. Stand up against it. I thank God for every politician that will stand up and say, well, I don't care what you think about me. I don't believe in gay marriage. I believe in what God set in order. Know what you think. Oh, you're going to lose your job. So be it. Stand for what you believe and don't and he wouldn't, he could have bowed down to this Haman and get promoted, but no. And Haman hated him. Not only that, he hated the Jews. And throughout the 127 provinces from, from uh, the land of Cush down to India, there was those who hated the Jews and who wanted them. They'd come amongst them and they hated them. Now they didn't ask to be put there. But I want to just maybe move backwards to go forward. And I'm going to say that um, I want to read a scripture from Zechariah, just leave that one up, that's the only scripture I've got. But, but Zechariah 12 says, 
verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants a, a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Echoes of what we read in Isaiah this morning, isn't it? This is a messianic prophecy from the prophet Zechariah, just like Isaiah gave us these messianic prophecies, the one who's going to be pierced, and hundreds of years has to pass before the prophecy will be fulfilled. I want you to notice something in this prophecy. This prophecy would be around about the time when the children of Israel returned to Jerusalem. You know how God opened the door and they got back? We were talking about that last week with Nehemiah and Ezra the week before. Well, verse 11 of Zechariah 12 says, On that day the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Rimen in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each clan by itself with their wives by themselves. The clan of the house of David, now remember, David is the promise of the forever king. Okay? From his household there will be the forever king. The clan of the house of David and their wives. The clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. Who's Nathan? Nathan is David's son. I thought Solomon was David's son. But Nathan is also David. Why is he mentioned Nathan in this prophecy? This is interesting. He was one of the sons of David. The clan of the house of Levi. Well we know who Levi is. And their wives. The clan of Shimei and their wives. Who's Shimei? Well we've just read about Shimei. Who's descended from Shimei? Mordecai. And his cousin, who became known as Esther, are descended from Shimei. And all the rest of the clans and their wives. Now in that year, in that prophecy, the Jews returned to Jerusalem after the exile. And if you actually read in Nehemiah 7, verse 67, these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, in company with the Rubabal, Yeshua, we mentioned him last week, didn't we? Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramiah, Nahamanah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispera, Bigvai, Nehum, and Bana. Was this the same Mordecai who returned? I don't know. But it's an unusual name. And he went back. Praise God. We don't know what happened after the story of Esther. But some people, may, if it was Mordecai, he must have been a right old man. We don't know. But it's interesting about this Shimei. Because when you look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 3, which follows the genealogy through Joseph. You know that uh, Matthew follows it through Mary. In Luke chapter 3, uh, if I just jump down to, I'm not going to read it all, but I just want to get the idea of what I'm saying. In Luke chapter 3, it talks in verse 27 about the descendants, Joseph, who was presumed to be the father of Jesus. He wasn't, because God was his father. Mary was a virgin. But the lineage was looked on from her husband. And it says, the son of Zerubbabel, we've just read about, the son of Sheltiel, the son of Neri, the son of Meko, the son of Adi, the son of Coston, the son of Elmadam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Madat, the son of Levi, who we read about in this Zechariah prophecy, didn't we? The son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Elkim, the son of Mela, the son of Mena, the son of Mata, the son of Nathan, that we read about in the Zechariah prophecy, the only time it's mentioned, the son of David, the son of Jesse. So there we have, and this name Sheltiel is also uh, rendered Shimei, a genealogical link from the family of Esther. To Jesus Christ. Now I'm not going to say any more than that. There are people who read into that. And they actually. Some people reckon that. After uh, this story. You know how the Jews were delivered through Esther. They would say that what happened was. Six years later. King Asherusis or Exerce. Depending on what version you read. Was actually assassinated. And uh, he. Um, some people think that Esther. 
actually married again and was involved in the direct lineage. Now, I'm not even going to go, go there. That's speculation. But what I'm saying is it's interesting how uniform the scripture is in protecting the lineage that is going to bring forth Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus Christ is not brought forth, and why does the devil hate the Jew? Because the Jew is the one that's going to bring forth. What did Jesus say to the women of Samaria? Salvation is of the Jew. Salvation is of the Jew. And of course he does. And of course to exterminate the Jew is Satan through his servant uh, Haman who is going to destroy God's plan of salvation. The forever king who is going to be the descendant of David, Jesus Christ. So it's interesting that there are these genealogical links. You can study that up for yourself. But we'll leave that to the side for a moment. And we'll talk about the actual story of Esther. Now you know what happened in Esther. And of course, by the way, the name of God is not in the book of Esther. But the name of God is all over Esther. Apparently there are five acrostics in the book of Esther. Hidden, the following lineage. And you get the name Jehovah four times. And the name I am once hidden because hidden in all these works of history is what God is doing is God sovereign you know President Trump is waxing lyrical yesterday he's away over in Singapore he talked to the man from North Korea he's going to wax lyrical but behind everything that they do and they don't do Jesus Christ and God is sovereign and the works of God will come about and we read it up there if Esther doesn't go in and do this God will bring it about some other way. And I'm going to tell you something, and I don't know if care if you like it or not. If you don't fulfill God's plan for your life, God will bypass you. And he'll find somebody else. Don't miss out on God's call. Now this woman had to sit in the gap, separated from her kith and kin, keeping it secret she was a Jew, until the, the word came. Now Mordecai had spoiled an assassination plot because he hung about the harem and he heard a couple of the officers discussing an assassination. He told Esther, he got word to her. Esther could send out her eunuchs like you send out people for messages and they could get messages back and forward. And she warned the king and the king was spared. They investigated and the two guys, according to the new international version, they were impaled in poles. They were executed. They were going to kill. Now the king was eventually uh, assassinated according to history but According to the Bible, he was spared this time because of Mordecai. Now, this is all part of the plan. And then, of course, this Haman had got his cell well in. He said, look, there's a people amongst you who don't belong. Let's get, sh- get rid of all these people. And they named the day. They named the day when they were thought to be destroyed. All the Jews were to be destroyed. Mm-hmm. Haman got it with the, the signet ring of the king on the, on the document and these people were ruthless in these days. Let's wipe these people out. We don't need them. Just like Hitler tried to do. And of course, the day was named. Now, I have a brother here from Rwanda who probably know more than I do, but something happened like that in his own country where genocide was tried to be brought about. And they named the day. They sent out a signal uh, through the Tutsis and the Hutu. And uh, they said things like, cut down the tall trees, I think that's right and that was the signal that it wipe out genocide a nation, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked, incapable of most wicked of things but thank God God had a plan and this woman who basically was just a woman from the harem but because she had pleased him, she was given as a trophy queen she wasn't allowed to go into the to the king unannounced if he didn't hold out the scepter she was finished and what did Esther say she said fast and pray for me and the Jews to this day they say fast and pray and they, all the whole of the Jews fasted and prayed and we were praying in there in the prayer meeting if we want revival we want things stopped from being the way they are we are on the eve of destruction we are on the eve of dis- do we not wake up and see we are on the eve of destruction Men and women have forgotten God and they'll be turned into hell. And they're being turned into hell. And they're being released into hell never to return again. They're on the eve of destruction. Our nation has forgotten God. And so she said, if I perish, I perish. Pray for me. And she went in. 
And she said, look, you're counting me in. And this law, it's going to destroy all the Jewish people. And of course, she didn't do it like that. She did it certain different ways. There was a whole, read the story. Uh, the king, God worked in the king because he had a bout of insomnia. And he called for the chronicles to be read to him. And as they read it, they realized that Mordecai had not been rewarded for revealing that he was going to, the king had been a sack. And they brought Haman and they said to Haman, what should we do to the man that the, 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 the king wants to exalt? Of course, Haman thought he was talking about him. And he said, oh, you should put him on a royal horse. He should do this and do that. And he thought he was going to get promoted. And he said, right, let's do it to Mordecai. Of course, poor Haman must have wet himself. Because he hated him. He hated him. Isn't it wonderful how God turns tables? The queen said, well, come to my banquet and come to another banquet and bring Haman with you. And then it is put to him and it was the king's turn to be angry. And Haman got executed on his own scaffold that he'd set up for Mordecai. God delivered the people. Mordecai was exalted. Mordecai was sent out to reach all the people and tell them the good news. And let me just read a wee scripture to you. If I we're going to take something from this message this morning. Uh, let's just read Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Praise God. So if we're looking for the similitude we, with um, Esther, when the set time had come, she had to put her life on the line. She had to go in. She had to surrender her own entitlement to life to bring about salvation for a nation. Now, as we know, she was spared. But it's a bit like the story in Abraham, the father of faith, when he put Isaac on the altar. She put herself on the altar. Are you on the altar for God? If I perish, I perish. I'm going to see this through. You know, we've got a lot of weak-willed Christians Top Johnny Anderson used to preach the woe to those at ease in Zion, down in Lodi Bar. You know, whether all at ease when we should be alert and awakened to the call of God in our life. Well, she got it. She had to wait a long time, four years, separated from her own family and her own people. But then the time came when she put her life in the line. She was made queen and she had the opportunity to plead the cause of her people. And yet the Bible says that the, set, the time had fully come. God sent his son at the time. Born of a woman. Born under the law. To redeem those under the law. The same thing happened with Jesus. At the set time, Jesus stood between life and death. The eve of destruction for us all. Was there not a redeemer? There is a redeemer. Hallelujah. But I want to read something. Just to, to take home the message uh, this morning. You know, the deliverance of this people was actually amplified because not only were they spared from death they were able to eradicate those who were out there to hate and destroy them and they were allowed to turn the tables and actually to go against their enemies they were set free by edict of the king and uh, we read in Esther 8 verse 10 God used Esther and Mordecai right to bring deliverance of people but let's read what the Bible says so Mordecai wrote in the name of the king and sent the news throughout the kingdom by mounted couriers on fast horses. King James talks about swift horses. He sent out the news on ambassadors to the whole of the 127 provinces all the way from India to Kush, which is Upper Nile Valley. He sent all these fast horses, go fast, swift horses, carrying the news. You've been delivered. You can now take possession of your enemy's land. Do it. What a message do we have? Are we tardy about it? Are we slow to tell people the gospel is there? Do we ever witness? I was in there buying some plastic for the, the church last week and the fella told me his story, his life story, and I told him the gospel. Do we do that? Do we share the gospel? Every opportunity to be make swift to share the gospel. What a beautiful message. 
You don't have to die. You can live forever. Hallelujah. So God used Christ to bring about the deliverance of his people and we have the privilege and we have the responsibility to carry this news and we need to be fast about it. Why? Because you don't know what a day will bring forth. The Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. This is a wee shop eh, over in Toll Cross. Honest Johnny called himself. He says, All stock, half price tomorrow. You see, half price tomorrow. All stock. So you go back the next day and you say, well, can I get it half price now? He says, no, that's tomorrow. Because tomorrow never comes. We must get the news out today, you see. Today is the day of salvation. So what a wonderful message in the book of Esther. When we understand that God has delivered the people. And he's given us a deliverance through Jesus Christ. And we can reach people, nowadays we can reach people faster than ever before. See social media, texting, emails. People hardly use their phones now. That was fast in my day. I remember as a young boy tramping across Sweden and I met a man who had a big radio mast in his back garden. I says, can you get messages? He says, you know, I could speak to my daughter when she was a mystery in the jungle through that, through that big mast. Could you do that? Could you get a message to my dad? He said, where is he? I said, he's in Glasgow. All right, he said, there's a radio ham running about Lanark. We'll see if we can get him. He gets through on his message. And I came home from Sweden. And my dad says, a man, a man phoned me up for Lanark. says, you were in your shopping in Sweden. And he said, to see, we're getting on all right. The message gets through. Nowadays, I can talk to people in Africa. I can talk to people in Australia. I can talk because we have communication. But what are we doing with it? Talking a lot of nonsense. Talking a lot of garbage, what you had for your dinner. You see it on Facebook. They, want to sh- they show you a picture of what they're eating. I said, why, is- why don't we tell them something worthwhile on swift horses? Send out swift news that people, you need Jesus. Isn't God good? God is good. He spared us and Esther stood in the gap. Just as the Lord Jesus stood in the gap for us, and we are redeemed today. We're going to close our service. In times like these, you need a saviour. What a wonderful hymn. times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. We're going to uplift the offering. And if anyone would like prayer, just come to the front while we sing this hymn. And we'll hold back a few minutes in the service just to pray with you. In Jesus' name. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. 